thanks very much for the invitation and to Alessio for giving a really interesting uh, talk. Um, I think, uh, yeah, one thing I am continue to be really interested about this area is these the the parallels between what I'm about to talk talk about and what Alessio talked about. Um, when actually when we we worked on this problem, I had no idea that there was they were so similar. Um, but now kind of more and more they look more and more similar from a certain point of view. Many, many things are different, but but certain things are are kind of the same. So um, uh, I'll try to mention some of that. Um, I also have to apologize because I'm I'm using slides with no writing. I don't have anything to write on where I am right now. So um, it, you should interrupt me for sure and ask questions if anything is unclear. Um, so otherwise, I'll just breeze through my slides in 10 minutes and we'll be asleep. OK, um, so yeah, today, everything I'll talk about is joint work with Christos Mantelidis and Felix Schultze. Uh, and I, I yeah, I want to talk about generic regularity in a different problem. Um, not the obstacle problem, but still sort of an elliptic variational problem. Okay. So that's the plateau problem. And probably people here are familiar with that, but I'll just remind you uh, what I'm going to talk about. So today, of course, this is not the, the only interesting question you can ask in this direction. Um, but what one, one question you can ask is take a co-dimension two smooth embedded orient close like sorry smooth embedded close oriented submanifold of euclidean space right so you should think a circle like a, a curve in r3 right with a given orientation and then the plateau problem asks to find a least area hypersurface whose boundary is that curve right and so to be clear okay i won't talk any this won't matter in the rest of the talk besides behind the scenes um but I, I'm always going to talk about the oriented problem, right? So I always mean M has a has a given orientation, and the the boundary of M is it agrees with the, the orientation of gamma. Okay. And so um, similarly, and so uh, since this is uh, allegedly potentially about scalar curvature, I'll, I'll, I won't talk about this much in my talk. But you can, of course, also instead of like uh, constraining the class of competitors you consider by the boundary, you can also constrain them by the homology class. So, uh, sorry, that's supposed to say alpha in HN. And so um, for a n-dimensional homology class, integral homology class, you can look at surface, like uh, hypersurfaces representing the homology class and try to find one of least area. Okay. And so... Um, the sort of the famous results in this direction say that a solution to this problem exists if you allow singularities. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you some example if you're not, if you haven't seen this before, some example of what, what that means. But already, it's quite remarkable um, that, I mean, this, this problem is quite nonlinear. Uh, it's not a priori like a PD question because you don't know, you can't necessarily write these things as graphs. So it's right, quite remarkable that you can find a minimizer in this problem, but it, it turns out that there could be singularities. And so the uh, the key tool, and I'm going to use this several times, the key tool is the following monotonicity formula. So if you look at the, the you have a minimizer, and so this holds for, for minimizers in the generalized sense of uh, De Georgi or Federer Fleming. Um, so if you look at a minimizer and you look at its mass or its area in a ball of radius R, and you divide that by the corresponding like a uh, ball of n dimensions of radius R, this is going up, right? As you increase R, okay? So this is the monotonicity formula. And I, I'll always denote this mass ratio by capital theta sub M of X comma R, okay? And so you should always stay away from the boundary. In this talk, of course, the boundary will be important to set things up, but exactly like Alessio said, once you once you do the boundary appropriately, uh, you you don't need to work. You don't need to analyze things near the boundary. You actually work away from the boundary. So we're never gonna we're never gonna see the boundary from the point of view of our analysis. And so another remark, which will become very important later, is that this monotone quantity is constant, right? So it's always non-decreasing as you increase R. But it's constant if and only if you're a cone centered at the center point X, right? So if and only if you don't, like, if you look the same as you change the scales, of course, 
the monotonic quantity has to be constant, but the converse actually holds. Okay, so these are the two main facts you need. All right. Okay, and so using the monotonicity formula, you can do the following. I'll just show you a movie of the, the tangent cones. So suppose you have a area minimizing hypersurface and you put it in space and it has some singular point. If you zoom in at the singular point, using the monotone quantity, you can prove, well, so using compactness, you can take a limit. If you do a blow up sequence, you can take a subsequential limit. And then using the monotonicity of, of the area ratios, you can prove the limit is a cone. Okay. And so uh, one thing which I'll just point out, it, it won't play a role in what I'm, it won't be clear from what I'm going to say that this is, this is uh, important, but one very crucial difference between the minimal surfaces and the, the uh, obstacle problem is that this tangent cone a priori could depend on the sequence chosen. So um, I guess it's a famous, it's a famous open problem to decide whether or not it, it depends on the, the sequence. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, as far as, uh, yeah, we definitely don't have any examples where, it, where non-uniqueness holds. But in many, many cases, we cannot prove uniqueness of the tangent cones, right? So only in some special cases, which are already very hard, uh, can we prove uniqueness of the tangent cones. Okay, that's just a technical aside. Okay, so using this analysis and the study of area minimizing cones, um, it, it turns out that really remarkably, up to seven dimensions, the area minimizers are complete, uh, or sorry, area minimizing cones are flat. And as a corollary, area minimizing hypersurfaces are smooth, right? So this uses what I just said. So at a singularity, you get a tangent cone and plus some epsilon regularity. So if the tangent cone is flat, then actually you could not have been singular. Okay. Um, are there any questions up until now? I assume this is old hat. Okay. And so then, shockingly, maybe, I think this came as a big shock, but in, in eight dimensions, there does exist a singular area minimizing cone. So Simons wrote down the cone, Bombieri, DeGiorgi, and Juicy proved it's minimizing. Um, and it's actually very easy to write down. So you look at R, R8 is R4 cross R4, and you look at the points where the norm of the R4 coordinate equals the norm of the other R4 coordinate. This is obviously a dilation invariant. Uh, and this turns out to be an area minimizing cone, and it's not flat. So in fact, so this shows that in R8, you can have already a zero dimensional singular set, right? The origin is singular in this cone. And in fact, using dimension reduction, now it's a standard GMT tool, you find that area minimizing hypersurfaces have a singular set of dimension n minus seven. I always, I always have a hard time saying what the n and n plus one and n minus seven work out to be, but in R8, you get zero dimensional set. In R9, you get a one-dimensional set and so on, right? At most, zero-dimensional, at most, one dimension. Okay. And so um, Al Alessio talked about the uh, structure, the study of the structure of the singular set, right, in the obstacle problem. And similarly, that's a problem which has received a lot of attention in the minimal surface side. Um, I think our understanding here is quite a bit worse. So um, I'll just, I, this won't really be the focus of my talk. But I'll just tell you um, briefly what's known. So Cheeger neighbor improved the Hausdorff dimension estimate to Minkowski dimension estimate. And then uh, neighbor and Valtorta, for sort of, I should have had also cited Leon Simon here, um, showed that the singular set is rectifiable, which is basically up to a set of lower dimension. It's a, it's C1. Um, and also examples of, of Leon Simon very recently suggest that the singular set could be somehow fractal. Uh, there's a little bit of a question mark there because his examples are not known to be area minimizing. And the, the background metric is not uh, is not Euclidean. So it's not quite clear the situation there, but presumably um, the singular set could be quite nasty. Okay. And so since uh, we, I know it's not only scalar curvature, but I'll, I'll have one slide briefly talking about scalar curvature. And so um, the singularities cause issues when you want to, for example, apply minimal hypersurfaces to obstruct positive scalar curvature in an ambient manifold. So this is first developed by Shane Yao, and then many people have worked on this. 
Um, and so there are proposed solutions to the, to study these singularities by Shane and Yao and Locam. Um, these these uh, proposals are are quite uh, technically involved, and I, I don't think they're completely understood um, by most people. Um, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll point out even, for example, the Shane Yao approach, which I'm more familiar, uh, that's probably unlikely to handle every problem. So the Shane Yao approach really only works for the minimal surface obstruction that goes all the way down to dimension two. So where you induct all the way down to dimension two, but that's not the only type of uh, use of this technique. So for example, there's the Rosenberg conjecture that says that if M cross S1 is PSC, then so is, is M, right? And this was uh, recently proven in certain dimensions. So where M is five or six dimensional by Rade and Sachini Rade Zeidler. Uh, but but this their, their proof definitely does not induct down to dimension two. They only do kind of one step. So certainly the Shane Yao, the Shane Yao uh, higher dimensional uh, approach can't work. There. So that's just a technical side. And so what I want to talk about today is, is the alternative way out. And so this is the kind of the minimal surface uh, shape or conjecture. And so this says that area minimizing hypersurfaces should be generically smooth. Okay, for whatever exactly that means. Okay. And so let me just show you a movie of how you smooth the Simons cone. And so this movie was uh, first discovered by Bombier de Giorgi and Giusti. So what they find is that if you take the Simons cone, there's actually a completely smooth area minimizing hypersurface that lies to one side of the Simons cone. Right? You can find this by ODE methods. Okay. And so this suggests that, well, at least this special cone can be kind of perturbed to smooth in some sense. Okay, so that gives you maybe some hope for this conjecture. I think probably this example came before the conjecture was, was made, so maybe it's, it's vice versa. And in eight dimensions, indeed, the this, this uh, hope is realized. So Hart and Simon proved, so in for a six dimensional boundary, in R8, the area minimizer with that boundary, well, a priori could have point singularities like the Simons cone. But if you perturb the boundary appropriately, let's say you take a like an arbitrarily small C infinity normal graph over the boundary, generically that that boundary will have only smooth minimizers. And it will be like the minimizers will be unique. So there's one minimizer that's easy to prove. Um, but more uh, importantly, it'll be completely smooth. And so um, a while later, Smale used the Hart-Simon construction to do the same thing for homology minimizers. So you can, instead of moving the boundary, you should perturb the metric on an eight manifold and then co-dimension one or seven dimensional homology mi minimizers are completely smooth and unique. Okay, and so the key ingredient in this generic regularity statement is the following, which is called the Hart-Simon foliation. And so that says that this picture I showed you about the, the Bombier de Giorgi Giusti smoothing of the Simons cone is actually like a general phenomenon, right? So for any area minimizing cone, this smoothing exists and is unique in a certain sense. Okay, so let me tell you exactly what I mean. So take a smooth cone, so smooth cone for me always means the singularity, the singularity of the cone is exactly the origin. And so let U plus or minus be the, com the components of the complement. So the cone always cuts the, the Euclidean space into two pieces. Then what Hart and Simon prove is that on each side of the cone, there exists a completely smooth area minimizing um, hypersurface. And actually, the the dilations of this will foliate the u plus or minus. That doesn't that doesn't really matter for this this uh, this talk. Um, that's why you call it the foliation. And so, the second point, and this is the much harder point to prove. So, if you have an area minimizer 
in, let's say, the closure of one side, possibly singular. So any area minimized that, that weakly lies to one side of the cone, then it has to equal some scaling of that, that, that smooth surface that you found in step one. Okay, so I'll abuse notation and say that zero times the S plus or minus is the cone. Like you scale it down to zero and get the cone, okay. right? And so um, the, the, the weakly is not so hard by the strong maximum principle, either it agrees with the cone or it's disjoint. So you could also say that if you are strictly to one side, then you're equal to some scaling of S plus or minus. And so this, this theorem assumes, so the Hart-Simon theorem assumes that C is smooth, right? So the singularity is only at the origin. Uh, so Zeon Wong a few years ago extended the first case, the existence of the smooth S plus or minus to all cones, right? So any cone, even if it's a singular cone, admits such S plus or minus. But the, the proving the uniqueness of S plus, or, like S plus minus, is much more difficult, like I said. And so for example, if in the very special case where you take a cone crossed by a Euclidean factor, and you assume that the cone is, is uh, regular and strictly stable and strictly minimizing, I'm not gonna tell you what that means, but some technical assumption on the cone, then uh, Edelin and Zeklahidi proved that the uh, Hart-Simon foliation, right? In this case, it's, it's RK cross S plus or minus because it just by invariance. So that's unique. So in anything that lies on one side of RK cross C is of this is of this form for some scaling. But uh, in general, even if you say RK cross C, where you don't assume that C is uh, strictly stable, strictly minimizing, just regular, not to mention there's probably uh, exists cones where the singular set is not a linear subspace. It's much more complicated. And then we have no idea what the, uh, the, the, the validity of two. Okay, so th that we'll come back to this later, but I first wanted to show you how to use the Hart-Simon theorem to prove the Hart sorry the Hart-Simon foliation to prove the Hart-Simon theorem, which is generic regularity in eight dimensions. Okay, right, unless there's any questions about this. Okay, so uh, here, exactly like uh, Alessio said. You, you want to move the boundary data. So in this case, it if you've never thought about this problem, it seems like it's trickier, right? Because the boundary data is sort of, it's co-dimension two. So you don't quite, you don't quite know which way to move. But actually, if you think about it for a little bit, it's, you you really can move in the normal direction to M. So you, you, you sort of wiggle first. So the minimizer is unique. Um, oh, is there a question in the chat? Oh. Thanks, Frank. Is, is that in co-dimension one though? I think that's in, in higher co-dimension, definitely. But I'm not sure he can do that in co-dimension one. Okay, we, we can talk about that at the, at the end. Um, okay, so at priori, it seems like there's co-dimension two ways to wiggle the boundary, but actually there's really only kind of one way to do it. I can explain that later if somebody wants to know. Um, so you move gamma up and down. I'll label it gamma S. I think Alessio used T. Um, and so for each boundary, let's minimize. So in this problem, this problem is not convex. So there may exist multiple minimizers. That's not going to matter. We're, let me just basically ignore that for this talk. But it re really doesn't play a serious issue. Okay. And so um, because I moved up and down, the minimizers will be ordered in an appropriate sense. Of course, it doesn't quite make sense because if you take two disks lying over each other, they look ordered, but how do you make that precise? You have to think a little bit. Okay. So, but in this case, so we moved up a bit, we found some um, new minimizer MS. Sorry, let's see. And so I want to assume that that new minimizer is still singular. And I'm going to show you this as a contradiction, right? So. I want to claim that when I move up a little bit, the minimizer becomes completely smooth. Okay. So let me limit as S goes back to zero. And I'm assuming that the, the, there's a singular point in, in MS. 
And so I can always rescale so that singular point has a distance one from the origin. And so I'm assuming the singular point converges to the origin. So if I sit at the origin, the rescaling, on one hand, it's a blow up of M at a fixed point, right? So that's going to converge to some tangent cone to M at the origin. On the other hand, the MS, I take a fixed rescaling or a rescalings of a sequence and the MS lie on one side of M. So in the limit, I get some M tilde, which lies weakly on one side of the cone. Okay, so I've drawn that picture on the right. And it's a consequence of epsilon regularity and the monoticity formula that singularities converge to singularities, right? Smooth can converge to singular, but singularities always converge to singularities. That's what I just said. So there's some point on M tilde, a distance one, based on how I chose things, which is singular. Okay, so the cone is regular because it were an R8, right? So eight dimensional cones are always regular. And this blow up M tilde lies weakly on one side. So it's a, a scaling of the Hart-Simon foliation. But there cannot exist a singular point in lambda S plus or minus at distance one, right? The only possible singular point in lambda plus or minus is if lambda is zero, so that S plus or minus is the cone, but then the cone only has a singular point at distance zero, the origin, so it's at distance zero, okay? So that's a contradiction. Is that okay? Okay, so what I've come to talk about today is, is can we generalize this to higher dimensions? Okay, so let's say you, you want to study generic regularity in, in higher dimensions. Um, you'd like to, well, the first thing you should try is to generalize the Hart-Simon method. So you face two obstacles. The first obstacle is that you don't know the Hart-Simon uniqueness theorem for singular cones, most singular cones, right? like I said. Okay, so you could work on this problem very hard. Um, it seems quite difficult to me. Um, may, maybe maybe you could prove this. Let's say you worked for quite a long time, you can prove this. But unfortunately, you you don't you haven't solved. Let's say you prove Hart Simon for singular cones. Um, I used to think this was the only obstacle, but actually this doesn't really help you very much, because let's say you try to run this argument in nine dimensions, exactly the same way, right? So I have a singularity coming in. I, I blow up at distance one. So I get a M tilde, which weakly lies to one side and has a singularity at distance one. Well, if I know that everything strictly on one side of the cone is smooth because it's in the hart simon foliation, we don't know that, but assume I did. I still don't know how to rule out the blow up weakly lying on one side of the cone but the cone could have a line of singularity. So it could have singularities at distance one, right? So there, there doesn't seem to be a good way to rule out M tilde sticking to the cone in the blow up limit, right? Because it, it, all you have is like a, you have a strict inequality for each, each positive, each before you take the limit, but that can always turn into an equality when you, after you take the limit, okay? And so th this is no contradiction. So maybe you say, oh, let's choose a better blow up sequence, et cetera, et cetera. It's possible that you could do something, but it seems quite unlikely to, to make an argument like this. One should never say you can't you can't make it work because someone someone will come come along and make it work. Are there questions about that? Okay, and so what I'd like to tell you about today is uh, what we've proven is that in nine nine and 10 dimensions, you can make this, this, this thing work appropriately modified. And so you can prove that generically uh, area minimizing hypersurfaces are completely smooth, generically completely smooth. Okay? And so uh, we, we basically uh, can follow either the Hart-Simon approach or the Smale approach and, and ha handle either the, the plateau problem or the homology problem, it doesn't matter. So generically means a C infinity perturbation of G? Uh, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Or uh, like a 
in a, if you look at the, at the in the normal bundle to the gamma, then there there's like in the C infinity normal bundle, it's like because there's open dense set. Um, and I should say, I think we can probably do eleven dimensions with Zihan Wong, but that uh, is still under in progress. Um, but I, I think we're we're really stuck past that dimension exactly. It, in mostly for a mostly similar reason as with the obstacle problem. Uh, I don't know. I don't know exactly if it's the same reason. But essentially, we also do not know how to use non-monotone families, and I think that also seems to be the the obstruction. Right, so, okay. Okay. So um, first of all, remember there was two problems. The first problem is that we don't know Hart Simon in higher dimensions. Right? Um, and so this problem, well, if you think if you think about it, we uh we didn't really need the full strength of the Hart Simon theorem in the Hart, uh, the Hart Simon foliation theorem in the Hart Simon generic regularity theorem. Right? When we proved the Hart Simon generic regularity theorem. We did this blow up argument. We got something on one side of the cone. We said it's equal to a leaf of the foliation, therefore it's smooth, right? We would be happy if we, we don't care if it's a leaf of the foliation, we just care if it's smooth, right? And right, like going through the fact that it's the leaf of the foliation is a convenient way to say that it's smooth, but it doesn't actually play a role later. And maybe we could get away with a little bit less Let's settle, instead of saying that it's smooth, let's say that it's less singular, okay? I'm not gonna exactly explain this, this part very well, but here's the proposition. So suppose you have a non-flat area minimizing cone, and suppose you have area minimizer strictly on one side of the cone. Then, oh, I, I didn't define the, de the, the density of a singular point, but okay, I'll say that in a second. For any point on the thing on one side, the density lies strictly below the density of the cone. Okay, and the theta sub m of x is the limit as r goes to zero of the monotone quantity. This exists by monotonicity. Okay? So this is equal to one at a smooth point, and it's bigger than one, strictly bigger than one at a non-smooth point. So you could think that higher density means more singular. Of course, that doesn't really make any sense, but at least intuitively, you can keep that in mind. Okay. Okay, this is this statement is okay. Uh, and the, the interesting thing about this is, so the Hart-Simon theorem, the uniqueness of the foliation, uses, I mean, from like um, our point of view, it's not that complicated, but it uses some non-trivial analysis, right? So you need to do some spectral, spectral theory, some sort of uh, like relatively delicate linear linearization argument, et cetera, to prove uniqueness, some maximum principle. But this argument is is basically like trivial, sort of from first principles of monotonicity. Okay, so I can give you the proof. Okay, it uses a few facts. But... Okay, so take a, a, a minimizer on one side of the cone, strictly on one side of the cone, and assume that there's some point with density at least that of the cone, right? This is the situation we'd like to rule out. So we have our cone and we have our thing on one side. Now let's blow down the whole picture, right? The cone doesn't change when you blow it down. The thing on one side blows down to what the tangent cone at infinity because it's area minimizing. The monotonicity formula tells you there's some tangent cone at infinity, but still that has to lie weakly on one side of the cone, right? But the, the tangent cone at infinity also has the origin in common with the cone. And the, the, the maximum principle for singular minimizers actually tells you that this can only happen if they agree, right? There's various ways to prove this, right? This is proven by Leon Simon in this setting, I think. Um, Okay, so first of all, so this tells you that by virtue of lying on one side of the cone, M tilde has to have tangent cone at infinity equals to the cone, okay? So now, 
start monotonicity at X and then make the ball very, very big. The, the density ratios at this very big ball limit to the density of the cone, the tangent cone at infinity, right? That's just because the, the monotone quantity is scale invariant. And so we saw that the tangent cone C tilde at infinity is the same as the, the cone C, okay? So we, this proves the inequality without, with not the strict inequality, right? So the density at X is less than or equal to the, the density of the cone. Okay, but now suppose equality held here. This would mean that the uh, monotonicity formula held with equality at all scales, right? Because if, if it ever increased a little bit, then we would be strictly bigger, okay? Because we've sent the radius to infinity. But this means, right, if, if, if you equal, equality holds at all scales, then you must be a cone. So therefore, m tilde would have to be c translated to lie at x. Okay. And so if c is disjoint from c plus x is disjoint, if you can take a cone and translate it off itself, right, then you can dilate this picture to see c, c, c plus any factor of x is disjoint. So this means you can move c freely in the x direction. This is sort of playing the translation versus scaling game. And so, okay, this is like a bit of a hand wavy proof, but you can give a proper proof of this. This basically means that the cone is a graph, right? If you have a hypersurface, you can move up and down without touching itself. It should be a graph. But now if it's a graph, it satisfies the minimal surface equation. Solutions to the minimal surface equation are smooth, right? You, you, can you have a removable singularity theorem for the minimal surface equation. And so therefore the cone is flat, okay? So of course, notice that the, the, the theorem fails for flat, the flat cone, because if I take the flat cone, I it can take M on one side, which is just another plane, that there's no density drop, right? The density of any point here is one, the density of the cone is one. So I don't gain anything. So I needed to use the non-flatness of the cone. Okay, is that okay? Any questions? Right. So you'll see, you'll, you know, I'll just point out this is actually this this proof is very simple, right? There's not there's not that much that goes into this once you see what to do. Okay, and so if you if you're not an expert, you can ignore this just to say, so the rea in reality, what I really want is the following. So if you have if you're area minimizing weekly, weekly area minimizing on one side of the cone, then for any point, the density is at most that of the cone, and equality holds if and only if you're in the spot, if you if you equal the cone and you're in the spot. Okay. So this is exactly giving you some kind of like a dimension reduction type um condition, right? So the, the points of maximal density precisely lie in the in the spot. Right. Um and so uh okay, if you're an expert, you it's kind of clear what what to do with this. And I'll, I'll come back to this, the, the conclusion you get from that in a moment. Okay, so let me show you how you use this in the generic regularity problem. Okay, because <laughs> remember that like, this is a weaker version of Hart-Simon. Even if you know Hart-Simon, it's not quite clear what to do. So you still need one more ingredient. So, okay, let's go back to our setup. So we move our boundaries. And we, we want to move them so that the minimizers are, are pairwise disjoint, okay? So we move up and down, exactly like in Alessio's talk. And so let S, exactly like in Alessio's talk, be the union of all the singular points of all the plateau solutions. Right, for, for every, this is the union over S. So I, I allow the boundary to vary. And so this version, weak version of Hart Simon, it's a little, you have to think a bit. Um, it took us a while to kind of figure out uh, exactly the best way to do this. Um, I think actually in Alessio's paper, it's done in a very uh, clean way. Um, and so using the previous proposition, 
you conclude that the dimension of the union of all the singularities is at most n minus seven. Basically, right, I said that if you, you lie close to a cone, you must lie in the spine. The, the top density singular points must lie in the spine. So using that, you exactly do dimension reduction if you say things in the right way, and you get this n minus seven dimensional estimate for the singular set. And so this is exactly the same dimension as that of a single leaf, right? So you, you know that there could exist one leaf of this dimension, so you might expect, like, let's say you could get like a n minus, uh, like you maybe you you add one because you're doing some sort of foliation by n minus seven dimensional sets. But no, you get exactly the same dimension. So this is an improvement of the, the standard stratification, right? So this tells you that, well, maybe you're in business now because probably generically it shouldn't be this bad. That kind of gives you some hope. Okay, I'll pause for questions and then try to say how we conclude. Okay, so now to finish the, the problem, what we need to do is define the timestamp function. This is Christos's uh, terminology. So let S be the singular set of the foliation, so like the union of all singularities, and let little s be the, the, the function which takes a singular point and reminds me which S corresponds to that singular point, right? So for any, because the leaves are pairwise disjoint, for any point, it lies in some minimizer with some boundary. That boundary is a gamma sub S. And so I take singular point to just that value of S. And so again, our goal is to say that the image of little s is not everything, right? So if it's not everything, then there exists some le some gamma sub s so that there's no singular point on that minimizer, right? And so, okay, we could have, I could take minus one to one very small instead of, you know, so this really tells me that in a tiny neighborhood of zero, there's some completely smooth point. Okay. And so my goal is to say that the image of this timestamp function is not everything. And the proposition that, that you prove is that this little s is a 2.1 holder continuous function on the singular set, capital S. Okay. So this may look very funny if you're, uh, if you've been told too many times that there's no interesting Holder, holder continuous function for alpha bigger than one. But of course, that's only true on Euclidean space, right? So if you have a holder continuous function on the interval of with holder constant two, then it's constant. But you can easily come up with many metric spaces or whatever where this is like perfectly a reasonable condition. And so um, in particular, if you know this, now this is a very easy exercise using the Hausdorff dimension. So that the Hausdorff dimension of the image is less than one if the dimension of the, the domain is less than or equal to two, right? So if the domain has smaller dimension than the Hausdorff measure, you can just like uh, cover it to choose the proper cover by balls, then look at the image of those balls. That gives you a cover by balls of, of uh, the 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 image and you just check that 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 cover to the, the correct power uh, sums up to just a small number so that, that that gives you this estimate and so this is where the nine and ten dimensions come from because our estimate for the holder con continuity okay 2.1 is a fake number but we we get some number between two and three right and so 2.1 is bigger than two so you can handle a singular set of dimensions one or zero one or two so in other words, in dimension nine, you get a one-dimensional singular set. Dimension 10, you have a two-dimensional singular set. Dimension 11, you could have a three-dimensional singular set. But th since three is bigger than 2.1, uh, this argument doesn't handle a three-dimensional singular set. Okay. So let me just briefly... I, I, I have an elementary question. If this dimension is smaller than one, why are you done that? 
in this. Oh, case. because if if the the Hausdorff dimension is less than one, it cannot be surjective. Ah, uh, ah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. Like yeah, it's, it's it, this is yeah, no, no, it, I it's a, it. equally yeah. saying the Lebesgue measure of the image is not yeah, yeah okay or zero. Yeah. So no, notice this proves something a little bit better than not surject. Like this proves in particular, like uh, uh, the the complement of the image is is dense, right? So, um, so I should be able to find points arbitrarily close to the origin, which are which are good. So that that's why I wasn't too worried about taking minus one to one. But yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Uh, I'll pause for other questions. Sorry. So if I apply this result, then you will have also probably something analog to what we did in the sense that in I dimension, you will set that the dimension improves. That's, so the same way right. we got H minus four, I could do like a query type argument, right? And then you exactly. get yeah. So um, in our in the first paper, we we the argument was a little less optimal, and so we didn't know how to prove. We we kind of coupled the two steps in a bad way, but then we wrote a short <laughs> note that shows how to fix everything. But actually, I think even the short note could be improved by using what you do in your paper. Like the the f limits to f almost every at all count, but countably many lemma. So. Um, I think actually everything could be made a little bit simpler, uh, but yeah, we get that exactly. Yeah, so it's really parallel. Like, so nine is dimension two for us, ten is dimension three for us, and eleven is dimension four. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and uh, maybe a comment I can make. I will not enter, but you don't need two point one. You only need two to dimension ten. I can show you how to do that in a difference another moment when you. Uh, okay. Moment but, it's the borderline case, but you can still oh, so, do it. Yeah, but so in our in our yeah, but in our proof for holder continuity, we oh sure yeah so but we we never quite know so okay the, uh, let me let me maybe come back to that comment in a second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So uh, let me explain how we prove the holder estimate briefly, and then um there I think there is some interesting point there. So um, let me illustrate the holder the holder estimate by the following in the following situation. So let me take the Simons cone, the Bombier de Giorgi Giusti one sided minimizer. Right, this is the same as the Hart Simon uh, foliation. And so let me then okay, I didn't do this in my picture. So let me imagine scaling S down by lambda. So I'm I'm blowing it down. And I want to compare the distance between this point x on the on the uh, s, we'll scale down by lambda, with the cone, like to the origin. And I want to compare how this look at this how this compares on the boundary of the ball of the unit ball. Okay, because this is a model a model situation for the problem, right? I have I have the if I throw away everything outside of the unit ball, I have two boundaries gamma and gamma s, and these are very close. And I want to see how close the point X gets to the singular point on the cone. I'll come back to the fact that X is not singular later, right? That's that's an important point. So you can prove that the two, uh, the cone and the foliation decay towards each other at a polynomial rate. And so what I, this is what I just said out loud. So I want to I want to scale down by lambda. Um, and I I want to compare the distance between lambda times x to the origin, which is, of course, just, I mean, comparable to lambda. And I want to compare that to the, the distance on the unit ball between lambda s and the cone. Okay. But this is just simple, like, scaling, right? So uh, my parameter little s, which is supposed to be how far they are at the unit ball, I can just compute by un unwrapping the scaling, right? So that's the same as as okay, lambda times the distance between the unscaled thing at the ball of radius lambda inverse to the cone. And so by the polynomial decay, the the distance between S and C at the scale lambda minus one is is lambda to the mu. And I gained an extra lambda but just by the distance scale. Okay. This always I always have to do this in private. I hate these arguments in public. Um and so the lambda to the one plus mu, right? Lambda is approximately the distance between lambda x and the origin. So 
Now, notice this is exactly a holder type estimate, right? I'm estimating the, the parameter of X. So as I, I, on the left-hand side, maybe this should have said S of X, right? So this is telling me which leaf X or Lambda X lies in versus the, the distance from Lambda X to the origin, right? So this is exactly like a holder estimate. And by an estimate of Jim Simons, just stability of the cone tells me that mu has to be bigger than 1.1. I mean, you, you give an, there's a sharp estimate here that you can, you can get, but it doesn't matter. And so in particular, right, this tells me that I have a holder constant at most, at least 2.1. Okay. And so um, one thing which is strange is that this argument did not use that X is singular. Only it, you, it only used that one of the, like it only used kind of that the cone is singular, but X is in the support, right? So this is kind of a stronger theorem than saying that the, the, the points in the singular set cross singular set obey a 2.1 holder condition, right? It's a bigger set. So I, it's harder to satisfy the holder condition. Um, and so this shows you that the 2.1, okay, if, if, if I replace 2.1 by the correct number, if I look at support cross singular, the 2.1 estimate is sharp. But I don't actually care about that statement. I really care about estimating singular cross singular. And so a priori, you could hope to improve the holder constant at that step, although that's completely unclear how you would do that. And so then um, just let me briefly say I, 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 what I think I understood Alessio's comment to be, and then I, maybe he can correct me if I misunderstood. And so we have some problem proving. Um, so I, I, I know the, the, the trick to prove that it too would suffice. Um, and actually in R11, you can prove that the, the, the top stratum should have a, a holder constant three in some sense. Like the, the Simons cone cross R3 has a holder constant exactly three. But when, when making like th this argument that I just sketched, when you do it in reality, you need some linear analysis, but you can only do linear analysis over the, like the regular part of the, the, the cones, sort of, you have to work away from the singularities. So at, at each scale, you kind of use Harnack inequality several times to handle the like the cutoffs. And so this introduces some sort of like a logarithmic error. So I think the best I could prove is like a like three minus log holder holder estimate, which I, I think is not enough. Like it, it doesn't seem like it's quite enough to handle the the uh the R11 case. So is there something seems dangerous when you have singular cones somehow to do the linear analysis if you want to do the sharp estimate? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I will stop here, but I'm glad to have any more questions or comments or discussion.